everybody. <laughs> My name's Eric Wallace. Uh, we are now going to be talking about a uh, study I did on a performance disorder. Um, goes by a couple names, doesn't quite have a name. I thought the simplest thing to do would be to just kind of demonstrate the disorder I'm talking about. It's all on the same track. So. <laughs> Right? What's essentially happening is air is coming in before it can be turned around to turn into tone, uh, to start a note. Uh, the respiratory muscles constrict, the larynx closes, uh, tongue does stuff. Um, and the first note it becomes either delayed, repeated, explosive, or sometimes completely hold. So, a bit of background I actually had this uh, disorder, this problem for about five years. I left it as an uh, undergrad in LA. Um, I was lucky enough to go to UNT to study with Jan Kegwes. Um, like I said, after having it for five years, it progressively getting worse and worse. Uh, within one semester with Jan, uh, my symptoms had been severely reduced. My second year at UNT, I made a uh, symphony orchestra, which is one of the top groups at UNT. Um, within a couple years, my symptoms were uh, essentially completely gone. I now consider myself completely recovered. Uh, it's been years since I even thought about having a kind of relapse. So having had this problem, uh, having been retrained, masters comes and goes, I start my doctorate at UNT, which I'm doing now, uh, and it made sense to me to want to try to study this problem. Uh, what is it? Uh, why did I develop it? How was Jan able to retrain me? Am I able to develop some kind of pedagogical protocol that would help me uh, help other people with this problem retrain? Right? And so I, I found out immediately into uh, researching this problem. Now the literature for it is a hot mess. Uh, it doesn't really have a name. It doesn't really have a classification as a disorder. Right? So how can I develop a study to kind of investigate uh, this problem and figure out some kind of interventions for it when I don't know what to call it, right? Uh, how can I uh, justify creating a study when I can't really prove it exists, right? Other than I had it and I know people that had it, right? So the first step uh, had to be uh, an epidemiological study, survey. Epi epidemiology is the study of a population at a time. Right? So I started a, a epidemiological survey of this problem. Um, I was here last year and I gave a lecture on the, the history, the literature, on uh, some different connections with uh, known disorders between, uh, with this problem. So I'm going to do a little bit of backtracking, catch us up from what I did last year. So, um, like I said, this, new, this problem comes in a bunch of different ways. Um, I have a feeling we went through the room, we'd get at least two, right? The, the, the name that exists in the only uh, scientific literature for this problem I've been able to find is musical stutter. Um, this is in the speech language pathology. Uh, this is the whole of the scientific literature about this problem. It is for single subject case studies, which case studies are not uh, super reliable forms of evidence in a single subject case study is pretty low well as far as scientific evidence. And then there's one other epidemiological uh, survey uh, out of Alabama, I believe, from 2002. Um, it's, a, it's a good study, a, a relatively small population, and again, it's, what, it's about 15 years old, and it's pretty old for an epi survey like this, right? Um, so not a great body of literature about musical stuttering, and the name musical stuttering is problematic. Right? Stuttering doesn't necessarily have any physiological symptoms associated. So by calling this problem musical stuttering, we're ignoring the, the uh, respiratory muscle constriction, we're ignoring the, the larynx, using that name. Uh, another name I'm guessing the one people here are most familiar with is Valsalva. Right? This is also a problematic name because the name Valsalva maneuver is already taken. That's the name of a, a physiological function that everyone in this room has probably done several times today. It's what your body naturally does when you sneeze or lift weights or 
Try to blow your nose like that, pop your ears when you poop, when you give birth. If everyone wants to take a moment to try to poop your pants, you will experience Valsalva maneuver, right? It's something we do. It's been in the medical lexicon for about 300 years. So you can understand why naming this performance disorder Valsalva maneuver is problematic and confusing for people in uh, the medical profession, right? Uh, and the only real evidence I've been able to find that you about this disorder using the name Valsalva maneuver is anecdotal which again has, has lots of value, right? Trombonists and musicians we use it a lot, but it's not the most scientific, but not the most rigorous form of evidence, right? There are better forms of evidence. So this uh, essentially makes up most of the body of literature about this disorder specifically. There's related literature here. There's studies on the measure of the glottis used during playing. Uh, Dr. Illis uh, came here a couple days ago and gave his MRI lecture. Uh, on tone use between dystonic and healthy French horn players. Uh, that's very cool. Um, there, there are stu there's a study that measures uh, what they call valsalva maneuver in musicians, but they're really talking about actual valsalva maneuver, right? They're measuring thoracic pressure during brass playing. Um, so none of these are exactly about this problem, maybe different aspects of this problem during brass playing, right? But none of these are really about the disorder that we're talking about here today. Uh, there's something called spasmodic dystonia, which is a focal disorder, focal dystonia of the larynx, which is, again, it's similar, right? This problem affects the larynx, spasmodic dystonia affects the larynx, but, again, not quite the same thing. Spasmodic dystonia uh, doesn't affect the respiratory muscles like this problem does. Uh, spasmodic dystonia is also constant. Uh, spasmodic dystonia, it's, a, it's a, a clenching and trembling of the vocal cords, right? And it's constant. It's every time you talk, whereas the disorder we're talking about occurs at the beginning of a note. You try to start a tone, right? And then once you move air, uh, typically it tends to free up, and then you're free to play. So it's not quite lined up with uh, spasmodic dystonia, this focal dystonia of the larynx, but it does bring up an interesting point, which is focal dystonia. There are, there are definitions, criteria for what makes a form of focal dystonia, uh, and this disorder and what well, we're talking about that I'm studying does meet a lot of those criteria, it does match that definition. So this is kind of where we left off last year's uh, my presentation, which is this, uh, this uh, disorder does match up with the bas uh, basic definition of what is focal dystonia. So, uh, what's next? Ah, so the second step, what I did uh, immediately after uh, last year's presentation is I started creating the survey. The survey I was gonna send out to brass players to investigate their experience of the problem. Step one was to uh, des uh, design a definition of what this problem is to, so we can send it out to brass players and they can determine whether or not they've had the problem where we're studying, whether or not they're in the talk, uh, target population. But how do, you, um, how do you define a problem to use for a survey when the purpose of that survey is develop a definition for that problem, right? It's hard. Uh, what we ended up uh, Frankensteining together is a, a definition using the various descriptions from those four case studies, which is the bulk of the academic literature about this problem, uh, and descriptions uh, attributed to Arnold Jacobs about his descriptions of the problem. Um, we kind of combined those. After last year's presentation, I posted a video, and I got some help from some really uh, amazing musicians who gave up a lot of their time to help me. So once we uh, Frankenstein did our definition together, we sent it out, me, me and Dr. Chesky, uh, my professor, to these different musicians uh, to kind of develop and refine our definition for this problem. What we ended up putting together is this. Several influential brass instrument teachers have noted working with students who experience a freezing sensation from starting a note on a limited team. Arnold Jacobs used the term about soft maneuver when discussing his problem, saying it's not uncommon among the students. Jacobs described this problem as an increase in internal air pressure, closure of the throat, and a choking sensation. Other academic articles reported wind players who experienced musical stuttering, which they described as a perceived tightening of the chest and throat muscles, a sense of locking up, and subsequent delayed, explosive, or rapidly repeated personnel. 
However, little is known, is actually known about this problem, how it is experienced by grass musicians, or if there are other ways in which it is problematic. So this is the definition for this problem we put together. This is what went out on our IRB approved uh, announcements uh, for the survey. And this was at the beginning of the survey, followed by the question, have you experienced the disorder described, uh, the problem described above in your own playing? Yes or no. They click no. Uh, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, contact Eric Wallace. If you say yes, you get to go on to the uh, rest of the survey, to actually take the survey. Um, I sent it out to a database I collected of grass teachers um, uh, from different universities throughout uh, America, essentially, a huge database, uh, various social media sites, a couple uh, uh, music organizations helped me out in distributing the survey. Uh, we sent it out, we collected, we sent it out June 3rd, I think, we collected results for about a little over four weeks. We started uh, actually collecting data um, early July or uh, processing data early July. Um, we ended up getting 781 people responded to the survey, and 781 people uh, clicked the link and started the survey. Of those 781, 429 said yes to having experienced this problem in their own life. Right? Um, it was a long survey. My professor would say longer than it should have been, but I needed to cover a lot of ground. And not everyone made it to the end. And I thought it was cleaner and easier to just take the, the, the respondents who made it all the way to the very end of the survey, right? So there's no dealing with people dropping out at certain points, which gave us a total study population of 252 respondents. Uh, and so all the data we're talking about for the rest of the study is uh, a survey population, study population of 252. Uh, a couple interesting notes. The epi study I mentioned earlier about musical stuttering had a total population of 225. Uh, 75 of whom uh, had reported actually experiencing this problem. So this is a, a much bigger number uh, than uh, the only previous uh, epi study. Um, I'll talk about why that's cool uh, later. And then also, of the 252 we're talking about, 127 reported currently experiencing it. So about 50% of the study population here uh, reported currently experiencing this problem in their own plane. It's about 16% of everyone who clicked on the link. So here we have the basic demographics of the respondents of the survey. Uh, these are the instrument categories we listed right here. Trumpet and variants, virtual variants. The breakdown of which instruments uh, responded most. And then the, the gender, mostly male, 70% female. It's about accurate of the trombone population. I did a trombone study. It was a similar uh, proportion of male to female. And that one person didn't answer for gender, but gender is not really important for this study, so I can ignore that. So, one of my tasks as a uh, preparing this presentation is deciding what is the big story worth talking about here today. And I thought we could talk about the, the characteristics and how it's experienced by people, and it'd, be, it'd probably be interesting, right? But I thought there was a, a bigger story here in this data. Uh, and it is the one we ended on last year, which is, could this problem be a form of dystonia? Um, so, when designing the survey, I wanted to try to develop some kind of quantitative measurements that allow me to make comparisons between this disorder we're talking about and known forms of focal dystonia. Um, and to do so, I use uh, Eckhart Alt Mueller's heuristic model of motor control disorders, which is this. Um, it's complicated. I'll, I'll break it down. Don't worry. Uh, this is Alt Mueller's, what he calls a heuristic model. I think it has a spectrum. And it shows the progressive worsening of motor control problems. Uh, here we have somatic problems like motor fatigue and overuse, which is just repetitive strain injuries, and choking under pressure, more psychological and how they progress and worsen over time into more severe uh, uh, motor control disorders uh, like focal dystonia and eventually the son of the foreign. Um, it's complex. It's very complex. It's very valuable. Um, but there's some of it uh, we don't need to talk about today and there's some of it we are not capable of talking about here today. So I wanted to try to distill the more uh, basic elements that we need to talk about for today. Here's Alt Mueller's uh, description of his, his model that we're talking about. 
a heuristic model assuming a continuous worsening of motor control from temporary subtle awkwardness to increasingly unstable motor control and finally fully developed bubble discomfort. Now, bring this together. Uh, this, this model shows how, how simpler, more, less serious, more situational problems like motor fatigue, which is just my muscles get tired, right? I played a lot, my muscles are tired. They don't hurt, they're just tired. How we can, uh, or choking on pressure, something that happens uh, kind of when you get really nervous, you know, particularly in high stress situations. Uh, things that have relatively low frequency, relatively low uh, intensity. Uh, incur for smaller durations or for uh, larger durations between experiences. Uh, problems with uh, lots of fluctuation between experiences and with lots of possibility for interventions, right? Motor fatigue, uh, there's a lot of uh, fluctuation between experiences. You rest, uh, it goes away. Uh, intervention, you take an aspirin or you're able to rest, right? And it goes away to a degree, to a degree, relative, right? And uh, how, what happens is over time, as you have these motor control problems, Right, for longer, the frequency, the intensity, and the duration with which you experience it start to increase. The fluctuation between experiences decreases, and the possibility of interventions helping you starts to decrease until the problem starts to become more habitualized, starts to be ingrained in the sensory motor uh, network. Uh, the fluctuation between experiences uh, and the impact of interventions essentially becomes nothing, and you're left with uh, essentially focal focus stone. Right? That is the, the idea of this model. Problems, which is a kind of catch-all term for something that's just not a disorder, something that just happens, right? over time develop into severe disorders like focal dystonia. And so the question we're asking here today is, does this disorder that we are talking about uh, here, the one I studied, the one we're talking about, does it follow this pattern of progressive worsening of motor control problems? Uh, which would allow us to make comparisons uh, between focal dystonia and this disorder. Essentially, does this disorder we're talking about match this progressive worsening of motor control problems, which would allow us to propose that this disorder is a form of focal dystonia? So, here are the questions we're going to be asking to make that comparison. Right? Is there a positive correlation between frequency and intensity? Essentially, as someone reports more frequency, are they also reporting uh, greater intensity? Uh, is there a negative correlation between frequency slash intensity and the fluctuation? Right? As the fluctuation decreases, it becomes more constant, more consistent. Does that also mean a, an increase in the frequency and intensity? Uh, will musicians in the disorder category? Remember over here is disorder, and over there is problem. Right? In the disorder category, have a more severe experience than musicians in the problem category? Meaning, uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about these last two in the detail a little bit more later. Will musicians in the disorder category have less impact than intervention? So, um, here are the different factors we are going to be looking at to answer those questions. The frequency, the intensity, the levels of fluctuation, the impact of interventions, whether or not interventions had a, a what kind of impact they had on the experience of the problem, and finally differences between problem and disorder. We'll talk about so this is a screenshot of the survey and how we measure fluctuation. Right? Right, the frequency of this problem in the following situations. We have three different times before the first round of peace, before the first round after the rest and while playing. The musicians were able to have kind of see the mouse and grab that slider and put it about, about where uh, they felt they experienced the frequency of, of that problem between never and every time I play. This is called the BIS, Visual Analog Scale. And this gave us a score between 0 and 100. And a similar um, scale, similar question for intensity, right? The slider, they, they take it, and they move it between mild and severe. So you can say my problem, I uh, experienced the problem before the first note of the piece, you know, pretty mild, but I experienced it before the first note of the rest, very severe, right? And that would give you two different numbers between 0 and 100. It allows us to make comparisons. The question is, is there a correlation between the frequency and intensity? So here we have frequency up there, the average frequency, average intensity, kind of cut off, and this is before the first round of the piece. And you can see, yes, there is a, a positive correlation between frequency and intensity. People who reported higher frequencies of this problem reported higher intensities of this problem. 
right? With a, a t value of zero, meaning it's uh, statistically very significant. We see the same pattern uh, experienced before the first note uh, after arrest and while playing, right? So there is a positive correlation between frequency and intensity and all times of this problem. So matching the model, is there a positive correlation between frequency and intensity? Yes. Okay. The second question, is there a negative correlation between frequency, intensity, and fluctuation? Here's how we measure it. This is one of the ways we measure fluctuation. Uh, they've got to pick one of these categories. So the pattern of occurrence for this problem, daily, that is problem to some degree every day. Regular, I have it most days, but not every day. Periodic, equal blocks of days where it would would not have it. And then there, I have a problem every day, every now and then, but there. The idea being someone who has it daily, right, is having much less fluctuation in their experience than someone who has it rarely, right? There. Uh, there. There's a lot of days where I don't have it every now and then. That's a lot of fluctuation between experiences daily, very little, right? You're waking up with it, you're going to bed. So uh, they got to pick one of these. Here's an example of um, frequency right here before the first one after the rest. Here we have average frequency reported for the different fluctuation of it. And you can see that people in the rarely category, uh, people with the most fluctuation had a much uh, lower average frequency and it grew as the fluctuation decreased. And there's that same pattern, where it's before the first note after arrest, same pattern at all different times of frequency. Right? So as fluctuation uh, decreases, frequency increases, frequency of the experience. And here we have intensity, and see it's the exact same pattern. Right? As fluctuation decreases, as consistency increases, so does intensity. So is there a negative correlation between frequency slash intensity? Fluctuation? Yes. Right? Now, here's where uh, we're going to take a. Uh, we talked about the, the disorder category versus problem category. Right? If you look on the spectrum, we're going to really start looking at how do, how do you determine whether or not someone falls into the problem or the disorder? Right? What we're going to look at is this. Right? Your dynamic stereotype falls right in the middle of the, the model. A dynamic stereotype uh, is all Miller's term for the point where a problem, like uh, pain or choking under pressure, starts to become a learned habit. Right? Now, the name dynamic stereotype is a deep cut Pavlov reference. It's just so showing that now this, this problem that you used to have has become ingrained in the sensory motor network. It's now a neurological problem. Uh, it is a much greater consequence. It is now a disorder. Right? That's, uh, all Mueller's term for when a problem essentially becomes a disorder. So when I say the disorder category is the one that falls here, right, into the, the dynamic stereotype and eventually uh, fall with the stony category, problem, that don't matter. Here's his definition for a dynamic stereotype. The motor and coordination and lack of motor control persists for more than four weeks. Even though rest has been observed, careful rehabilitation under the guidance of the therapist and the teacher has been attempted, one can assume a more grave alteration of sensory motor networks leading to deterioration of motor programs in the central nervous system. So, yeah. right. so how we determined a differentiated people that fall in the problem end of the spectrum from people that fall in the disorder end of the spectrum, and we just took this wording of Walt Mueller's definition right here, and we made this question. Again, this is a screenshot from the survey. Did your experience persist for more than four weeks despite pedagogical advice and or professional health care? And we made the assumption that if they're saying yes to this, uh, they are uh, falling under the category of disorder, right? They are meeting Alton Mueller's um, definition for what makes uh, someone uh, in the disorder category. So 150 of the respondents said yes. Um, so we're just going to assume, right, based on this definition, that these people fall into the disorder category. People reported no, uh, do not fall into it, right, fall into the problem category. And we had the unsure there question there to, just to make sure that people who said yes meant yes, and people that said no meant no. Because there was a third option. If you're unsure, you click unsure. Right? So 
people that said no meant no. My problem has not persisted for four weeks despite pedagogical help. Right? So now let's look at, here we have, back to average frequency going up here. And we have before the first note after arrest, cut off, before the first note of the piece, before the first note after arrest, while playing. And in red, we have people who selected yes to fall into the disorder category. And in blue, no problem category. And as you can see, people who fall into the disorder category have much higher frequency of this problem than people in the problem category. And here we have intensity, right? Same thing, same pattern. People in the disorder category are having a, a higher rate of intensity of this problem than people in the problem category. And then one last graph, I think. We're almost done with it. It's a dry presentation, I know, but it's important to be accurate with how we're making these determinations. I, I'll talk more. I'm sorry, thank you for bearing with all the, all the grounds. Um, here we have, again, the fluctuation categories. Daily, regular, periodic, rarely. Uh, in red is the people in the problem category. In blue, disorder category. And as you can see, people in the problem, very consistent across all fluctuation patterns, right? 666, six, six, to make up the bulk of the most fluctuating, whereas people in the disorder category, much less fluctuation in their problem, right? So there is definitely a difference in how fluctuating this problem is in people who experience it as a, as a disorder severity than people in the problem. So, no, we do have, we do have one more chart, that's right. Um, question, <laughs> will musicians in the disorder category have a more severe experience than musicians in the problem category? Yes. They experience a greater rate of frequ a greater frequency, a greater intensity, and less fluctuation than people in the problem category. Um, now, final, final bit. Near the end of, of this part of it, will musicians in the disorder category have less impact of interventions, right? Because as we know, uh, dystonia, it's hard to do anything with. Right? That's kind of what it's known for. I gave uh, a similar, but shorter version of this lecture at the Performing Arts Medicine Association two weeks ago. And man, they still don't know what to do with Elbershire dystonia. Right? Uh, there was a, a two case studies of people who had reduction in sym uh, uh, symptoms. Right? There, there are, have been successes, but it's still not something uh, people know that much about. So the, the likelihood of intervening in someone with dystonia or a, something like dynamic stereotypes, which is dystonia-like, um, is much less. So we measured interventions in two ways. We asked how much time you spent on interventions and how much impact those interventions had on your experience. Here's how we measured the impact. We're going to be talking about impact right now. Where the impact of the following interventions. Here are the possible interventions. Rest, pedagogical advice, professional health care. Um, so here's zero, no impact, and they got to report either a positive impact to 50 or a negative impact. They could say, I saw, uh, what a pedagogical advice, but it had a negative impact, right? It made the problem worse. Or I saw pedagogical advice and boom, fixed it, 50, right? It's great. Um, so here we have those same interventions, rest, pedagogical, professional health care. And you can see people in red in the disorder category had significantly lower impact of different interventions than people in the problem category. Right? People uh, who had a more severe experience uh, had less impact on the problem by rest than pedagogical advice, professional health care. Bit of an oddball, but you know, if your problem didn't persist for more than four weeks, um, you're probably not going to see professional health care. I think only four people. Uh, in the problem category, even reported attempting um, pedagogical professional health care. So, final, will musicians in the disorder category have less impact with interventions? Yes. Right? So, this, the evidence presented here suggests this disorder is a unique form of focal dystonia. One more time, because I think it's worth repeating. The evidence presented here. And this presentation suggests uh, this disorder is a unique form of focal dystonia. And something, something I want to kind of reiterate is for anyone in the room who might have this problem, right, or anyone watching the video that is hopefully going okay, um, uh, 
uh, that has this problem. It might be scary for me to say, your problem is vocal dystonia, or it might be classified as vocal dystonia. But remember, we're still talking about a spectrum, right? All I'm saying is that uh, the problem we're talking about can develop into, into a form of vocal dystonia. It does not necessarily mean anyone who has this problem or experiences it has vocal dystonia. It just means you have a motor control problem that might one day develop into a form of focal dystonia, right? In the same way that someone with embouchure pain, right, doesn't have embouchure dystonia. If they continue playing with their embouchure pain, there's a, 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 a likelihood that it might develop into dystonia, right? Uh, a lot of embouchure problems and dystonia, uh, they, they typically start as smaller problems. And we just ignore them over time, and they become learned habits that can ruin a career, right? So it's something that just to just be aware of. And I wanted to kind of tackle this one last point. Um, if you are maybe scared by the idea of you having dystonia, right? I want to go back to this slide and talk about this part of the right here, the professional healthcare portion. Um, 146 people reported, responded to my survey, reported attempting rest as an intervention for this problem. 195 people reported seeking pedagogical advice to try to intervene in this problem. 48 people sought professional health care. Musicians aren't going to see doctors for this problem uh, until it becomes extremely severe. And as a consequence, Doctors don't know. Performing arts medicine practitioners don't know about this problem. There's almost no literature. Uh, when uh, I started uh, talking about this last year, and talking with uh, performing arts medicine professionals over the past year, almost all of them uh, had no idea what I was talking about. And were a little reluctant to believe that it was a big deal. Because right? I've never heard of it. There's no literature. What do you mean it's affecting all the time? Right? They were much kinder than that. That was the gist of what I got. Um, Dr. Chesky, who gave me, my professor, who gave me permission to throw him under the bus, spent the 10 months attempt to develop the survey, preparing me for what happens when I get 15 responses, or less, right? Eckhart Mueller, the guy who developed that spectrum, who is probably the most prolific researcher in uh, dystonia in musicians. He publishes several studies on dystonia musicians every year. Uh, we emailed about it, and he, he was, um, he was concerned I wouldn't get any response to this problem because he said out of the 6,500 some odd uh, musicians he's seen in his clinic, he thought maybe 10 had seen him about this problem. So musicians are not seeing doctors about this problem and as a consequence, the medical community isn't aware of this problem. So if we want to make a change, if, if we want to try to, to fix this problem, I think step one is treating it as a, a the, with the gravity it deserves, right? This is likely a form of focal dystonia. I know when I had it, it was pretty debilitating. I think if, uh, if, I, if I went to the wrong place, I probably would have been worse than the point where I would have had it in my career, right? The, the emails that I've received from people since posting last year's video are pretty bad. Some people, I, I've had people who had to change careers, right? I can't do classical music even though it's what I love because my problem won't allow me to, uh, enter on time, right? I know as someone who had it, as a professional musician, a professional teacher, it is a big deal. And we need to start treating it with the severity, having more rigorous uh, evidence for this problem, more scientific evidence for this problem. And we definitely need to start communicating with performing arts and medicine practitioners. So here are some resources uh, for, for performing arts and medicine uh, practitioners. Uh, Artsmed.org. That's the website for Performing Arts Medicine Association, where I presented before. Uh, I checked a couple days ago, and there's a button on the top right corner that says referrals, and it was not working as of uh, two nights ago and last night. Um, so if it's still not working, email Nancy Connell, she's head of the uh, PAMA Referrals Committee. Email her and say, hey, I'm having this problem. Uh, there's evidence in the form of focal dystonia. You can link if she might not believe you because, again, it's not that well known. Um, say, I'm looking for a doctor, here's where I live. And she, there's a wide network of performing arts medicine uh, practitioners, 
and she will send you the name and contact information of someone who can help you. We can start spreading some awareness about this problem, and maybe start developing some better studies. Um, I have two studies in mind I'd like to do. One is, if this is a form of focal dystonia, it's trying to figure out what is it a dystonia of. Respiratory system, larynx, tongue, some combination of the three. Right? So just knowing it's dystonia doesn't really help. What is it a dystonia of? And then maybe one day trying to develop some kind of pedagogical protocols, figuring out what type of um, instructions could we give a musician to lessen the symptoms? Or what instructions could we not tell someone to try to lessen the likelihood that they would develop it? Again, it's difficult. Right, but that's my end game. And because I am naturally dramatic, I asked respondents to provide a one-word description of this problem. I took all those descriptions and I compiled it into this word cloud, describing their experience of this problem. Uh, thank you. That is it. And more answers, no answers guaranteed. Um, I think Bill was that Bill said the thing for a long time. Um, what we're going to notice this is very interesting. I don't know if you have any uh, um, insight to this, but uh, the two times that it hits me the hardest is um, slow tempos and when I'm really tired. Um, if, it's, if it's like a day where I haven't gotten to sleep, you know, so, uh, the tired thing is interesting. I've not come across it. The, the slow tempo one to me uh, makes a lot of sense. Eckhart Allmuller talks about something called reinvestment theory, which is the theory that consciously, uh, consciously controlling, which should be normally uh, automatic processes in the body, uh, can interrupt your ability to, to um, execute that function, right? Um, he calls it reinvestment, oh, he doesn't call it reinvestment theory, but there is evidence that reinvesting, thinking about these processes that your body wants to uh, control automatically, right? Um, interrupting that, that neural pattern that your body developed for executing that, that, um, that task kind of interrupts your body's ability to perform it. Uh, and if you, if you, the idea is that if you continually interrupt that pattern, right, now whenever you try to execute that pattern, we have two uh, competing neural patterns for, for the same, um, same task, and that's kind of how uh, motor control problems like dystonia happen. That's what the reinvestment theory says. Gabrielle Wolf calls it the constraint action hypothesis. Same deal, right? Con trying to control the, the motor function uh, when your body wants to do it automatically disrupts your ability to do it naturally and smoothly. And to me, slowing, uh, the slow tempo entrance, from my experience in thinking about these two uh, theories, makes sense, because it's slow. You have so much more time to overthink what you're doing. How exactly am I, is this supposed to work? How exactly am I breathing? What exactly is my tongue doing? There's so much more time to overthink, overanalyze, and have a dysfunction. Versus, in my experience, faster tempos can be more helpful. Jazz, more than a few people who said I, I, I had in my uh, classical career switched to jazz. Because jazz, you have the rhythm section telling you what to do. Da, 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 boom, entrance, right? You don't have to think about it. It's a little more automatic. Uh, and to me, that makes sense why slower tempo. The tired things, interesting. I'm not sure what to think about that. That's cool. But yeah, that's why I think having uh, a slower tempo or a, a a longer space before your enter would disrupt it. Right? More time to overthink over it. I can't help but think that uh, there's probably some people that experience this and then left. And that's it. Forget about it. Mm -hmm. don't want to be in music or the arts anymore and fly. Uh, what have you experienced like trying to reach out to those people or talking and get upset to them or any idea of. People that have, have quit music because yeah. of this problem? It'd be awesome. Uh, I, have, I don't know how to reach them, you know, because if, if you're not, uh, I mean, unless you became a teacher, right, like you're a working musician, got this problem, and you switched over to education, 
unless you're that person, if you, you know, got to high school or as an undergrad and you just quit music uh, before your career really started, uh, you're probably not um, part of the, the music community. So I'm not sure how I would contact them unless it was just random. Um, someone sent you a link. I did hear from a couple, like uh, the odd biologist or administrator from some university who sent my survey, emailed me, hey, can I take it? And I'm like, sure, if you, if you play and you add it, right? Um, yeah, I, I know, you know, like I said, some big name music, some musicians, working musicians who have this problem currently and have had it for decades, emailed me saying, hey, it's been a big part, and, uh, it's really affected my career, but they're still big name working musicians, right? But we don't know about the people who just left. That could be an enormous population that we'll never hear about. Yeah. And you think, oh. Is there any uh, evidence with either this or any form of vocal discerning that it's related to genetics in any way? That it, it oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I remember seeing something, but I forgot exactly what it was. We'll get there. We'll get there. There's a bunch, that's why I said this was complex and more complex than we had time to get into. There's all sorts of things I can't include on a, on a survey, an online survey. Genetics is one of them, right? Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that we just couldn't include, so we left it out. Uh, we did a pretty basic criteria uh, to meet uh, this model. And there's a lot of things we couldn't include, uh, or um, I didn't have time to process, right? Because we we started collecting the data from this about a month ago, and it's all being done by some lazy trombone player who's doing their best. So there's a lot of qualitative factors I haven't had time to investigate. Um, so yeah, genetics is definitely one of them. Um, uh, there's a, a factor of heritability, uh, inheritability uh, in focal dystonia. Yeah, Anyone else? This is, this is my dissertation, right? This is essentially what my dissertation is going to be. And then I'm going to uh, refit it into publication and medical problems of performing artists, right? And then once all that's done, yeah, my plan is to do uh, that eventually, right? Uh, I would say the first, the, the good scientist in me wants this first to establish what kind of dystonia it is. Uh, and the anti musician in me wants to do that thing. I'm trying to develop some kind of protocol, right? Get two groups of people with this problem. Tell one group this thing, tell another group this thing, get a third control, right? Maybe measure it over time and see if there are differences between the three groups based on uh, the instructions they are given. Maybe we'll see a change, maybe we won't, right? Test the, it'd be a way of testing your investment theory. It's complex and it's complicated. Uh, and like I said, the academic in me says uh, maybe later. So we'll see what happens first, uh, whether or not I get impatient. In that light, it might be worth talking about what how Jan helped you. And that's, I feel, I know that's I, I, as much as I would love yeah. to, to keep going into the next hour talking about that, I feel as far as the scope of this lecture, uh, I can't, if you want to talk afterwards uh, as unofficial musician Eric, that'd be great. Happy to talk to anybody, but for the purposes of this uh, one hour video slot, uh, I don't think I should. Um, anyone else? Sorry. I no, keep going. I, we got time. I've this for so long, so much. Um, I had a teacher um, who had us on for a long time. Mm -hmm. We wanted dogs and to study with him, and then he eventually like, don't even understand him. And then he's not playing anymore. Um, is, is there any evidence, either from what you gathered or from other uh, research you've read, and there's not much that you've said, but that extreme Valsalva can eventually uh, again, we, uh, evidence related to this problem, right, because 